we're not here to compete with anyone else. Like we're here to compete with like who God made us born to be. Like we're here to compete with who we know deep down inside we're capable of becoming. And when people really look at it that way, they're like, oh, that's when you know, oh, I'm I'm not in the right job or, oh, I need to start taking that dance class or, oh, I need to, you know, all those things. We know deep down inside if we're on that track of stepping into all, all that we are and, and, and all that we're created to be. I want to talk about when you said, um, I found comfort in knowledge that being underestimated can be a superpower. It sounds really great, right? Like we both have had experiences where we can now look back and say, oh, you just got to go. You got to push. You just got to believe it. What do you tell Again, that mom that may be home folding the laundry or that guy that's, you know, just got a divorce and is feeling on a down and out. How what would you how would you tell them to believe it? Like, even though someone's told, you no, or even though you're in that struggle, like, believe it. Right. So I think I think the very first thing is knowing And believing that like every one of us has this person, I believe we're all born to be. And I think Mm -hmm. most people never actually become that person. I think most people uh, end up for a lot of reasons, talking, like staying in their comfort zone, um, almost letting it chip away at their soul. Cause I think that's what happens when we stay in our comfort zone and also like talking themselves out of their own truth. Right. And I think the very first thing in order to believe that people need to do is make the decision they want to, Mm. right? That's the most important because a lot of people will never make the decision that they want to learn how to believe in themselves, that they want to learn how to believe it's possible to step into all of of who they're born to be. Um, And I think that, you know, there's a lot of um, lessons I've learned that now I really like share as tips in the book on, on how to do this, because I think we're all on a journey. Um, once we decide, <laughs> you're like, yeah, I, I want to, you know, become the person I was born to be, be, be step into all of who I am. Um, then there's a lot, of, a lot of, it's a journey, a lot of things we need to do. So, you know, um, one story, one quick story, and then some tips on what to do for that is uh, on underestimated is, you know, for me, I feel like I've always been underestimated for whatever reason. And I think sometimes when we're kind to other people, we instantly are underestimated. I think sometimes, you know what I mean? And I think that, I mean, one moment, for example, and I think you can use people's underestimation as fuel. And I think sometimes it, it, it becomes 360 and it, it really works as grace in your own journey. Um, and some people might say, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, things happen for a reason or the universe is always right or, or God always knows what he's doing. And there's a lot of, uh, if you're someone that's always underestimated, I don't think it's an accident. I think that it's actually supposed to be part of who you are on your own journey and the things that you become strong enough to overcome and smart enough to overcome, right? And uh, one example is, you know, this was before our launch on QVC, we we're a few years into the, this company. I'd started in my living room, thought it was going to be, you know, great. And meanwhile, we got down to under $1,000 in our bank account, which was our personal and our business bank account. I don't know, Sean, if you've ever, like, I would go to the ATM if I needed 20 bucks and like, I'd hit no receipt, right? I couldn't, I couldn't stomach seeing the receipt. And, um, (laughs) yes. Yes. Right. (laughs) And we finally got this call that I thought was life changing from a potential investor, private equity company. And, and they loved our product, loved our product. And I was like, Oh my gosh, Sean, this is gonna be huge because they, this particular private equity company had created, uh, or I should say invested in and built a lot of the products we buy at the grocery store. And they turned in a lot of like consumer products from unknown into big household names, huge companies. I was like, Oh my gosh, if they invest in us, like a, we're not going to go bankrupt. 
B, what if they can use their leverage to get us into all these retail stores that are saying no? I was so excited. And so we started doing meetings with them. And uh, meeting after meeting, we started the diligence phase, which is when we show them like all of our projections and the future products we want to launch and all that stuff. And I remember the final meeting. And I thought like this is going to be life changing. My husband and I flew up to this meeting and we were standing like three feet from the head guy. And um, he said to me like, we're, you know, we really love your product. And, and uh, we want to thank you for everything, but it's a no. We're going to pass on investing in your company. And I said, and I was so used to hearing no at that point, right? So I was like, okay, okay, um, but can you share why? Like, you know, you know, and because feedback's usually a gift. And, um, right. and he was literally like three feet from me. And he says, do you want me to be honest with you? And I said, yes, please. And then he, he literally looked at me and he said, I just don't think women are going to buy makeup from someone who looks like you, you know, with your body and your weight. And I remember as he was saying this to me, I remember like I felt my whole body flood with like a lifetime of body doubt and uh, self doubt. And it was so weird because I didn't get mad or even hurt in that moment. I felt this crazy feeling of like my own fear staring back at me, first of all, as he was talking And I felt this deep feeling, this deep knowing, I should call it, that he's wrong. But I also knew if I was ever going to prove that, (laughs) I would A, need to figure out how to believe it for myself, right? Because that's that's literally half of it. And I thanked him for his time, for his honest advice. And here's what happened in that moment. And by the way, I think this is the defining thing for so many people out there dealing with rejections and how to handle them. Our human nature, our humanness wants to go to um, a victim mentality, anger, all those things like, oh, F him. Like I like what a jerk, like all those things. Right. But it was like of all the things I did wrong. This is one of the things I did. Right. Where I was like, oh, my gosh, it hit me. He was passing on investing in our company because of my weight. I was like, wow, he is as much of a byproduct of the beauty industry his whole life as I am, right? It's like, wow, he's making business decisions because in his whole life, he's just seen one type of beauty on TV or in magazines, and he doesn't believe any other way will make him money. And I realized this, this why is so deep. It's so powerful. Like, Not just, oh, let me create products that work. It's like, and by the way, by the way, um, oh my gosh, I'll go off on this for an hour. But so many people, because I've seen so many people fail, right, in their businesses. And I feel like it's because they create their mission, their why, and it just sounds good. Like in this case, my why could have been like, oh, I want to solve my own skin problems. And I want to help other women and other people and other men and other people that are the same. And that would be a great why. And it would sound really good but it wouldn't have been deep enough to keep me going in all those hard years. And a lot of people have these whys that sound great. Like, Oh, I want to pay for my kid's school one day, or I want to buy a house. And like, those are great. And if you tell someone else that why they'll think you're amazing, but literally it's not deep enough to the core of pain inside of you. That's going to keep you going during all the hard times that face most of us. Right? So like in that moment, he was obviously completely underestimating me. I also knew I'm also underestimating myself and have to figure out not to, but I turned it into like fuel for that, like deep why, like the real why I needed to keep going. And here's the crazy thing about when we trust ourselves and we try and we learn to hear ourselves and trust ourselves, which is like half of my book on how I figured out for me how to, how to do that in a lot of cases and how other people can as well. But like, When we believe and trust, whether it's in the universe, whether it's a power greater than ourselves, for me, faith's a big deal. I believe stuff's divinely orchestrated in my life. And so many times these huge, painful rejections or setbacks or no's like suck in the time and they're devastating and they don't make sense and they're not fair. But like years later, right, we can look back on them and be like, oh my gosh, that was grace because Had this dude said yes to me at that time, Sean, I was so desperate. I would have been like, take most of the company for like anything. Just help us survive. And 
It's like, instead, because of so many people rejected me, I couldn't even give my company away for a little bit of money for so many years. And then by the time, fast forward many years, and we did bring on some investors toward toward the end, but fast forward to 2016, um, when L'Oreal bought our company, I was, I was still the largest shareholder and that changed my life. Right. And had he said yes to me back then, like who knows what I'd end up owning. Um, and, 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 and the day, um, so, and by the way, we met with L'Oreal for three years. I was really hoping to partner with them because I was like, Oh, they could take our vision and scale it globally really quickly. And but they said no for three years. And when, when it eventually was a yes, uh, they, L'Oreal announced that it was their largest acquisition in U.S. history. And it was this all cash deal and this big thing. And I got an email from that guy, from that investor, the day of the deal. Because it went on the Wall Street Journal online, the homepage and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And he said, um, I, uh, congratulations on your deal. I was wrong. Um, and it also I learned it would have been the most successful investment in his company history had he said yes right but he underestimated me (laughs) you talk about your why running deep right and it sounds good but I think you proved that when you it wasn't just about you I mean when oh yes yes. you he was saying no like not everyone looks like the person on the cover of a magazine or a a beauty mag not everyone looks like that so you and I would be bold enough to say that I believe that that's maybe 10% of the population. So you're, you're, you're excluding 90% of the population because of what you think beauty is, but not really going to the person that maybe they have beauty inside of them and this is what's going to bring them out. And so, you know, I just really want to commend you on not just – having something that sounded good, but it, mm-hmm. it made you like help other people feel good. And you said something earlier about uh, what you were born to be. Mm-hmm. And I know that this subject is, it was very emotional in the book. And, you know, as a person that never met their, their biological father before, you know, you also transcended finding out a secret that would devastate most. And you, again, had to believe it and believe in yourself. And I think you know what I'm talking about. Can you just share just a little bit of that? Thank you. Yeah. And you know, um, really fast, one thing you asked me earlier, I just realized I forgot to, you said how, for people in that moment when they're shaking and they're, how do I get through this? What did you do? What was your mindset? It's exactly what you just said. Like, I forgot to, I forgot to answer you. So just to share it really quick in case it's a value yeah. in that moment, um, when I'm shaking on live TV and I feel like everything's on the line, exactly what you just said, Sean, I knew it can't be about me or I'm effed, I'm done. Because literally, if you want the real truth, I was wearing double Spanx at the time. I'm like, my dress feels tight. Is my Spanx absorbing all my sweat dripping down because I'm freaking out? That's what's going on in my head, right? And if I stay, there's that famous thing, if you stay in your head, you're dead, right? I knew this is not about me or I'm going to fail. And it was like in that moment, that's when you dig deep and you call on your why. It's like, oh, this is like for every person out there watching who deserves to see a different who deserves to see me calling real people beautiful and meaning it like mm-hmm. that's what it was about and so in that moment the only way I got through it <laughs> it didn't fail it was like I had to make it not about me it had to be about something so much bigger than me um or I, it was just too much pressure to handle I think I couldn't have I couldn't have um you know, I couldn't have made it through, let alone uh, connected in an authentic way where people are going to keep their channel on me, not turn it off yeah. and consider buying the product. Right. Um, and that's the thing is like, and that's the other thing is your mission has to be so authentic because had I shown up with this why that was great, but not like the deep core, I don't think people would have connected the same way. And anyways, yeah. So um, I go deep in the book on some personal stuff. I would say 95% of this book I've never shared are stories and lessons I've wow. never shared before. How do you keep having this big faith and belief when you're getting no, 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 no. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, I feel like so many of us get rejection in all forms. Like 
every single day, right? Whether it's in our personal relationships or friendships or moms at the PTA meeting or in our careers or in our dreams. And I, um, you know, part of why I wrote Believe It is, uh, you know, almost every single day I get messages from so many women that will say things like, oh, I, I heard about your story. Like they heard the highlight reel, right? Or they saw social media and they're like, oh, you went from Denny's waitress to building this huge, you know, company, it cosmetics in your living room. And like, did it just, was it easy or did you get lucky or did you have connections or did you have a lot of money? And I'm like, oh my gosh, what I realized. And then they would share how they're stuck or they're getting rejected so much and they're about to give up on their idea or they're feeling um, excluded from mean girls at work or whatever it is, right? And I realized that when people just see um, social media or highlight reels or a lot of the stories out there, they just, they just see that, the highlight reel, and then they feel alone yeah. in their own, in their own journey. And, you know, my whole journey is really learning how to believe it. Like my real story is not oh, a business success story that that's part of it. But the real story is a girl who went from not believing in herself, uh, to believing in herself and not, tr- not even knowing how to hear my own gut to learning how to hear it and then trust it. Mm. Um, and I think that that is, the biggest goal in life. Like one of the things I talk about and believe it is um, how for a long part of my life. And by the way, I have to say, that's why I love your show. And I love that you have these conversations because they're so important to sort of like peel back the curtains and talk about the stories behind the stories that help us all feel less alone, more enough, (laughs) more, you know, uh, greater permission to feel how we feel and be where we're at and all those things. Um, I think that, you know, I talk about in the book a lot, um, all the rejections, all the setback. I also talk about being so outcome oriented, I guess, uh, goal oriented, and then realizing the victory I think in life isn't, did I set a dream and accomplish this dream? The victory is like, am I hearing who I am, trusting who I am and becoming all of who I am? And Ooh, yeah, you know what I mean? And I, and I think um, one of the things you, you and I were talking about before the show <laughs> was this idea too of, you know, how do you accomplish your dream, but not burn yourself out and all these kind of things and have it take a toll on your health and your, and, you know, I made a lot of those mistakes. Um, and I also, I also learned that and so many people who have had a big goal or maybe even achievers, by the way, I've never even talked about this on, a, on the press tour. Or anything, I love but that. I love, I love that. that. I'm like, <laughs> I want to ask you questions that nobody else has asked. <laughs> no one is. Yeah. Well, a lot of times when we're achievers or we have goals or hopes or dreams, and I bet you so many of your audience will relate to this, that when you finally achieve one, you're like, oh, mm-hmm. I thought I'd be happy then. Or I thought this would solve all my problems, or I thought life would be great then. And then what we end up realizing through life, or sometimes people never realize this is, is like wherever you end up going or whatever you end up accomplishing, you still take you with you. Right. And I learned that the hard way in, 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 you know, I I made the, I would call it a mistake, frankly, of working so hard. Right. And I, I know you and I shared this in common, I was so burnt out for so many years and I do not believe I had to work hundred hour weeks to sell a company for a billion dollars. I don't believe that when I look back. Mm-hmm. Um, I also know that we can all have big hopes and goals and dreams, but it's so important to realize where we're at now and, and, and the journey of stepping into all of who we are is the real victory, not the outcome or the goal or, or, the accomplishment, right? And, mm-hmm. you know, when I write, believe it, how to go from underestimated to unstoppable, I really mean unstoppable in our joy, our our faith, our belief in ourself, our trust in ourself and in our journey of, of just becoming all mm-hmm. of who we are. Um, and so that's what I I'm so that. passionate about. You, uh, there's so much there. And I want you to keep going. A couple of things I want to unpack there. Number one is this unrealistic image for women. It's really interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, 
with men, it really isn't that way. If you look at football, Tom Brady has a few ads. He's the good looking dude, right? He'll, he's got a watch ad or whatever. But the guy that got all the ads was Peyton Manning. It was the every man when it comes to men. With women, these unrealistic images, especially in the beauty industry, for the most part, are the images that we see. And so you really did revolutionize an industry. That's number one. Number two, it's interesting to me that your dream was to be a broadcaster. I got to tell you, we both bagged groceries at Safeways, and I was a broadcasting major in college, and that was my dream. I didn't know I was going to show up 30 years later, you know, after my entrepreneurial journey. But I think life starts after your first dream is mm. goes away. I really believe that's where you're defined. And I'm so curious about this journey with the rejection. I have a philosophy. I don't know if you agree with this. I love the title of your book, Believe It, because what you're talking about, turning up this volume on your inner voice and turning down the external rejections, mm -hmm. those rejections you got were over and over again. I actually, I was telling my son this, who thinks he wants to be an entrepreneur. He said, dad, what's one of the things that most people wouldn't tell you? I said, I don't know that maybe the most important thing is your ability to deal with rejection as an entrepreneur. We talk about vision, we talk about, you know, communication, but can you deal with the rejection? And in your case, it broke my heart, but there was one meeting you had where you thought you had a deal finally, right? With this VC guy. And I want you guys just to feel the, 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 the depth of the rejection that you may experience as an entrepreneur. And could you do what Jamie did and still push back? So picture years and years of rejection. You're running out of cash. You're working out of your living room. Everyone's telling you no. And then this dude almost says yes, but then really hits you with a hard no. Tell him about that. Yeah. And I thought literally he was going to be my saving grace, right? Because again, we were down to no money and we got an um, interest from, from a private equity company and they loved our products. Our product worked, like it really worked. So they loved the product um, and they wanted to have meetings. So we started going down that path and, you know, they were really big. I mean, they are really big. They, they've invested in a ton of consumer product companies that you and I buy at the grocery store and, you know, they made a lot of them household names from nothing. And I just thought, oh my gosh, if they, if they invest... A, I'm not going to go bankrupt. <laughs> B, yeah. um, maybe they'll help get me into all these retail stores that keep telling me no and keep telling me I'm not the right fit and all that. And so, you know, we did meeting after meeting and we started the diligence phase, which is, you know, where you show all your projections, your product pipeline, everything. And it got down to the last meeting and uh, my husband, Paulo, and I flew up for it. And I thought like, this is it, like this is going to be it. And uh, I'll never forget the head guy was about, was standing about three feet from me. And uh, he thanked me. He said, you know, that we should be proud of the product we created. Uh, and then he says to me, uh, and he's about three feet from me face to face. And he says, uh, so I want to let you know, it's a no. And we're going to pass on investing in it cosmetics. And I said, okay, like I'm used to hearing no at this point. Right. And I'm like, all right, well, you know, can you tell me why? Cause usually feedback is a gift usually. And, um, I'm like, can you tell me why? And he's like, do you, you want me to be really honest? And I said, yeah. And I'll never forget, like, I remember just like him looking at me for a minute and I remember feeling my heart racing really fast. Mm -hmm. And then I remember seeing his, like his lips move in slow motion. Mm -hmm. And he basically said, I just, well, he did say straight, straight to my face. I just don't think women will buy makeup from someone who looks like you um, with your body and your weight. <sighs> And I remember it was this moment where for me, it was almost like this lifetime of body doubt and self-doubt kind of like flooded my body and almost felt like, um, like I was staring my own fear straight in the eye, listening to him. And I, like I, A, I knew I had to keep my faith bigger than it. Uh, yeah. but Ed, in that moment, like it's wild. I actually, yeah, it hurt. Like I literally went in my car in mm. the parking lot and cried my eyes out. Mm. Those things hurt. Mm. But what stands out to me in that moment, and, and I actually never felt, I didn't get mad at him. I still am not mad at him. Because guess what? The whole reason, that whole why beneath the why on why I was doing this, this company, like he literally passed on investing in my company because he had the exact same uh, mindset, right? Right? That everyone else does yeah. about what you have to look like, the box you have to fit into to be successful. And, and he's just as much a, a, a I don't want to say victim byproduct maybe of, of the whole beauty industry too. He's passing on an investment in my company because of my weight. And, and I remember this moment, but the thing that sticks out to me most is in this moment, I had this feeling, this deep, this deep feeling, like as he's telling me this, mm. um, that he's wrong. And I had that feeling 
But I knew nothing yet that I had done <laughs> prove that because <laughs> I had no sales yet really. And I also knew like proving it would, would first and foremost hinge on me believing it mm. uh, uh, for myself. And, you know, fast forward. And, and by the way, in the years after that, like it's discipline of recognizing when, when, when someone else's voice is playing in your head all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. And I listened to a show you did actually where you, where you scratch, like you scratch it yeah. and right. And, and that's what I have to do over and over. Like I'd have to literally get really good at turning down the volume on those things because, oh, and I want to tell you a full circle moment that happened. That's so good. Um, but like, that's, I feel like that, what you, what you just shared about telling your son this advice, right? I feel like that's everything because yeah. I feel like so many people, what ends up happening is everyone else's rejections, right? End up like equating the self-doubt in our own head, our own self-doubt about ourself. We start to turn the volume up on that to the point where with all of it, with our, with, with everyone else's opinions. And mm -hmm. in my case, the lack of success around me, it can get so loud that we can't even hear our own internal knowing anymore. Mm -hmm. And I feel like so many people, uh, uh, and then you, your friends and your family, like they mean the best, but they're seeing you through their own line, their own lens of fear and an experience right and and so between all of it so many people i feel like end up literally talking themselves out of their own calling and talking themselves out of their own truth and staying in their comfort zone at like the cost of it chipping away at their soul we've all done this um and literally missing out on the person they're born to be wow. and i feel like that's and my story is like years and years and years of rejection. But when I look back at the things I did wrong and the things I did right, usually like my biggest mistakes came down to when I actually didn't listen to something I knew in my gut. And I, I decided to go with something an expert had told me when it didn't feel like quite right. Um, and the biggest successes are, are, are when I really listened to that knowing, mm -hmm. even when it went against what other people told me. So like, wow. This guy telling me this, had I changed who I was, right, and, and tried to fit some mold that he said would sell, the, if that were going to be, if that was who I was authentically, then great. But it's not for me, right? And so had I ever conformed to him or any of those retailers that told me, change this, change that, and maybe we'll bring you into our store, or L'Oreal that for three years of meetings said no and all the things I needed to do differently. Had I listened to most of any of that, especially the parts that didn't align with, with my gut instinct, I would have never sold my company for over a billion dollars. I would have never, I probably would be out of business. So, so that's you know, you yourself, when you say this, Jamie, where you're like, I would have never sold my company for a billion dollars. Still, when that comes out of your mouth, is there a part of you like, I sold my company for over a billion dollars. Does it still hit you a little bit? On one hand, I still can't process it. On the other hand, you'll understand this when mm -hmm. I say this. And you won't judge me for saying this. And yeah. I believe actually everyone in your community. Yeah. I believe they're part of your community because they'll understand this too. Mm. Um, selling your company for a billion dollars is exciting. But like for me, I don't feel like I'm put on this earth to compete with anyone else. I feel like I'm put on this earth to compete with who God made me capable of becoming. Amen. And I feel like I'm just getting started. Like yeah. I'm not there yet. Yeah. So so selling a company for a billion dollars is exciting, but like, I feel like stepping into all of who I am and serving and giving and all the things I'm really called to do, I still feel like I'm not there yet. By I the way, you talked about- I feel like having watched you speak a couple of times and then listening now, I feel like all of that happened, all of the struggle, all of the ups and downs, all of the selling of the company, all you've learned, all you've been able to articulate, your broadcast background, all of that stuff is leading you right now to your time. Like, I think you were called for what you're doing now, which is teaching and inspiring people and giving them hope. However, you did say it came full circle. Yeah. What did you mean when you said that? What's the oh, full circle? Ed. Okay, you love this. Okay, so <laughs> this is so good. Because I actually never got, like, I never got mad at him, right? Because for me, it was like something bigger than him. Yeah. Um, so, so, so fast forward a few years. Um, and when we actually ended up 
selling to L'Oreal, uh, you know, it was their largest U.S. acquisition in their history. And so it made the homepage of Wall Street Journal, a bunch of stuff like that. And the day that the deal was announced, I got an email from him uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and he said, you know, congratulations, you know, I was wrong. So proud yeah. of you, that, that whole thing he did. Um, and also I learned that it would, so two things, I learned it would have been the, the most successful investment in his firm's history. But here's the thing, and this is where, this is where our setbacks, I feel like, oh my gosh, our setbacks, even when they suck, like it sucked to hear him say those words to me. It hurt, I cry, like it hurts, right? Rejection in almost any form basically says to us, you're not enough, you don't belong. You're not worth, I don't think I will uh, make money off you or I don't believe in you or it comes in all those forms and it, and it sucks. But I really believe even almost all the time, when I look back at almost all the rejections, <laughs> I feel like that, like, again, those, those setbacks really are, are setups. And, and, and sometimes like, sometimes rejection is, is really like serendipitous grace um, wrapped in this package labeled painful rejection. And, and what I mean by that is I was so desperate at the time. <laughs> I think you just posted, I just saw your thing where you're like scarcity is value. Yeah. So yeah, I had no scarcity back then. I would have given him like any part of my company. We were down under a thousand dollars in our bank account. I didn't know how we were going to survive. Had he wanted to invest, had he said yes to us that day, he, I would probably give him the majority of the company for probably almost no money, just hoping to survive. But because he didn't believe in me and because we got so much rejection along the way, when we ended up selling to L'Oreal eight years into the business, um, I was still the largest shareholder. That's awesome. And so, right? <laughs> I love this. Serendipitous grace. I may mm -hmm. steal that from you. That is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And you guys have to say something. That's why you want to get this book. It's loaded with information like this. It's loaded with stories like this about believing it. Why do you need to believe it? Let's just unpack this rejection thing, and then we're going to get to a magic moment. The reason that I think your ability to deal with rejection is so important is not talked about enough. Let's just be honest. You know why 99.9% .9 of dreams die, everybody? You eventually get too much rejection. So if that's the thing that's going to cause you not to get your dream, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's just there becomes a threshold that you people don't take the rejection long enough. So they don't stick around to receive the grace. And so if that is true, if we already know that going in, then why not pre-negotiate in the, in the very beginning? What price you're willing to pay? Hopefully it's anything, as long as it's legal, ethical, and moral, so that the 99.9% the, the of the reasons why your dream won't happen, you've already set in your favor if you've just decided you'll take the rejection. That's why it's such a big part. How do you take the rejection? You got to believe it. And that's why this book is so powerful. So we lead to this point, guys. And again, the beautiful thing about Jamie's story is it's her vulnerabilities and her authenticity that made the brand relevant all the way up to the extreme magic moment. Don't hide your insecurities. Don't hide your blemishes, guys, figuratively and literally in your entrepreneurial journey. Get people wanting to root for you. Your fears and insecurities are what connect you with the marketplace. Ironically, you don't have to hide them. You can work on them, but there's nothing wrong with saying I have them. So finally, somehow, you get this moment on QVC, right? And you are so brilliant in this moment. You ask them, I'll let you tell the story. But to me, it's like, if you don't do this thing, again, maybe it still doesn't hit all the way to the last second, the last moment. It was your vulnerability that connected you with the audience. The first thing I'll say about uh, authenticity, because so many of us are scared to be who we really are, right? Right because we fear rejection or isolation or not being included or judgment or all those things. And first of all, <laughs> the, just one little tip, and you'll, you'll know this so probably way more than I do, Jim. But one thing that's always helped me is like so many studies out there talk about how it's impossible to have a real true connection with another human being if you show up as your representative, if you don't show up as your full authentic self for better or worse, right? The good parts, the bad parts, the quirky parts, whatever. And whether the relationships you want to have are with your partner or your customers or your customers or your community on social media, you actually cannot have a fully authentic relationship 
If you're not showing up as your full authentic self for better or worse. And so if right now you're listening and you're like, oh, well, I'm showing up kind of as the person I think I need to be, or I'm getting distracted by other people on social media because they're having great success or their podcast is doing well, or their business, my competitors' businesses are having success by doing this. So I'm going to do that. You are robbing yourself of, of that actual authentic connection with your own customers, your own community, or your own friends, or your own family, that literally is the only way, from my experience, to build anything that lasts, anything that matters. Like in my journey of now doing over a thousand live TV shows on QVC, right? I've met thousands of entrepreneurs in the green room and most of them only last one show, maybe two, and they're gone. And I like over the years, I would think, what is that commonality between the people who end up building something? And it's never how smart they are. It's never how skilled they are on television. It's never that. It's the ones that like are the same way in the green room mm. when no one's watching as they are on air. And they, they're not, none of them are the same. Some are crazy and wild and some are totally like, whoa. And some are really kind. But the ones that have that congruency oh. that show up on air and sell their product, whatever it is, whether it's a Dyson vacuum or a personal growth, whatever it is, they're the same, right? Because guess what? The, the, the people watching are able to connect because you can't fake authenticity. And I feel like learning that is freedom because it is so stressful when you feel like you need to show up on social media as something that you're not because you're trying to build a following and get more likes or you're, you're, you're showing up in the dating world and you're, and you're, you're, as your representative, because right, right. you, whatever, it is so stressful. But like, when you realize being authentic, is the, it's the most freeing thing because you, you, you now no longer care if something's working for a competitor in your industry or this or that, because it doesn't matter unless it's truly authentic to who you are. And, and um, one quick thing is like, I used to end up, we built to over a thousand employees. So I went from not paying myself for three years to over a thousand employees and they would get so sick of me saying this, but it, I feel like it was one of the keys to, to, to our success was I would, they would, you know, tell me something a competitor was doing or a new product launch or whatever. And I would say, listen, our, our biggest threat to our business is not what the competition's doing. It's the risk of us getting distracted by it and like getting tempted to dilute our own authentic secret sauce. That's it. And, and it was kind of like staying true to that helped us actually build something that mattered. And listening to that, even sometimes when the experts out there, or in my case, the retailers were telling me they didn't believe in it. Um, and one more quick thing uh, is just um, in this process, because uh, you mentioned, you know, the people around you, if they're doubting you, right? Another big tool just to share with everyone listening that, that helped me is just uh, everybody around you in your circle, whether it's friends, a partner, people you work with, um, uh, whoever, they're only capable of believing in your dream, whether they realize it or not, they're only capable of really believing in it. Usually if like their own lens, they're seeing it through of life experience and limitations uh, has already proven to them, it will be successful, right? Like so many people, even experts or visionaries, like they would never admit this, but like if you're doing something new or novel, or maybe it's been done a million times, but you're doing it your own way, it's really hard for anyone else to ever think it's going to be successful because they've never seen it be successful before because it's never been done the way you're going to do it. So keeping that in mind, and um, I, Jim, I would have this uh, imaginary volume dial and everyone listening has this. Okay. Imagine you have your control over your own volume dial. I think one of the biggest keys to overcoming self-doubt uh, on your own journey, whether it's to start painting again or to start writing that book or to just freaking go online and make an online dating profile and put yourself out there, right? I think like one of the biggest keys is learning how to control your own volume dial with who you let speak into your life about what. And 
what I learned. And again, I share a million things I did wrong in this. You and Paulo believe it, even when you maybe shouldn't have believed it. How did you keep each other positive on this, on this journey of rejection and a ton of no's? Mm, yeah. It's one of the hardest things to do. And I think that when I look back, like there is a lot of mistakes I made, a lot of times where I put experts' opinion on a pedestal instead of uh, my own faith and my own inner knowing, right? Which is so tempting to do. Um, and so, you know, one story I think that really captures uh because uh, I think so many of us connect through the power of story, right? And captures like some of the things we we did that helped us believe, helped us stay positive, helped us keep going. Uh, and they came out of some of the toughest moments. So uh, there's, you know, we were a couple years into the business. It was so hard. We were down to under a thousand dollars in our bank account, which was our not just our company bank account; it was our personal bank account. So anyone out there, whoever has been in that spot, and you like. You go to an ATM to get cash and you hit no receipt because you don't want to see it. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's what you do, can't like, that's where we were at. And uh, dollar hot dogs from Costco on the, the counter outside. Anybody who goes and eats it. The good thing is those taste good. But it was like, how do we conserve every penny we have? It was like a season like that. And we finally got a big call from an investor. Uh, at a private equity firm. And John, I was so excited because this particular private equity company, they've uh, invested in tons of like consumer product companies, like uh, products all of us right now buy at the grocery stores. A lot of them, they've taken uh, this particular PE place, has invested in some of them pre-revenue, some of them when they're really small and built them to these huge household names. So I'm sitting there going, oh my gosh, they see how our pro- like how good our product is, what we're doing. Like if they invest in us, like A, maybe we're not going to go bankrupt. B, maybe they'll have leverage and help get us in all these stores that are telling us no and get us on QVC is telling us no. So I was so excited and we uh, started taking meetings and they seemed super interested. We got to the final, final, final meeting after the diligence phase, which is when you show them your projections and your plans and all that. I'll never forget this moment. And it was a defining moment that helped me understand how do you stay positive in the face of adversity and opposition and hard times and setbacks. We got to the final meeting. Okay. And I was like, it's going to happen. Paulo and I flew in for the meeting and uh, they were so kind. Everyone was great. And then the head guy, uh, and he was standing about three feet from me. And he says to me, so, you know, we just want to tell you, we appreciate you. We're rooting for you, all these things, but it's a no, we're going to pass on investing in it cosmetics. And by this point, I'm so used to hearing no, right? And I'm like, okay, uh, okay, can you tell me why? Like, could you give me any input or feed? Because usually feedback's a gift, right? <laughs> and he goes, well, you know, do you want me to be honest with you? Like really honest with you? And I'm like, yes, please. And he, he was literally three feet from me. And he says, I just don't think women will buy makeup from someone who looks like you, you know, with your body and your weight. And I remember watching, it was almost like I I was watching his mouth move in slow motion. And when these words were coming out, I felt like this uh, lifetime of body doubt, body doubt and um, self doubt, like flood my body all at once. And I remember I, as I was watching him say these words, I wasn't offended or anything like that. I mean, it wasn't even about him. It was almost like I was staring my own fear straight in the eye. And I remember this moment where two things happen. Like I remember feeling like, okay, I need to keep my faith bigger than my fears right now. But I also had this deep feeling as he was talking where I knew I just felt he's wrong. He's wrong. But I also felt like if I was ever going to prove that, it would come down to me truly learning how to believe it for myself. And The other thing that happened, and I truly believe our setbacks, even when they suck, even when they hurt, even when they don't make sense, even when they're unfair, our setbacks are so often our setups, right? For, 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 for fuel of what we're supposed to step into. And when he said those words, you know, I thanked him for his time because what I realized in that moment was like, oh, he has seen the same images his whole life of what beauty is that I have too, right? He, him passing on investing in us because of my weight, that is 
exactly why I need to create this, like build this company, shift culture and beauty because it doesn't just affect women, it affects everybody. And he's a dad to little, right? And it's like, it affects everyone. And, and, and I never took his no personally. It fueled me. Um, and by the way, just a fun side note is uh, eight years later, when we sold to, to L'Oreal in our largest U.S. acquisition in history, I got an email from him. And, uh, and he said, congratulations, I was wrong. And, um, and I also learned we would have been the biggest uh, investment in his comp- the, the most successful investment in his company's history. Um, and the last thing I'll, I'll share is um, uh, on this is that, uh, you know, when I talk about our setbacks or our setups, had we said, had he said yes to, to, to us at that time, we were so desperate. We were so small. We had what looked like no opportunities around us we probably would have sold like the majority of our business to him for almost no money just to survive. Instead, we ended up, straight, because, you know, because everyone rejected us in big part, we ended up staying the largest shareholder all the way through the sale. And our life is so, and what we're able to do and how we're able to serve and give is so fundamentally different because of so many of those no's, even though at the time they hurt, they're painful, and it's like, I really think those, like so often the most painful times in our life and, and the rejections and the no's are often like just like serendipitous grace, like wrapped in a package labeled painful, you know, rejection. And so, um, so, you know, part of staying positive was really keeping the perspective the whole time of to, first of all, learning to learning to really tune in and trust our, ourselves and our gut, because so many people, even in your community, people I know, myself, this is always a journey and a struggle, is to figure out how to trust ourselves, right? And how to actually, because we're surrounded by so much noise, right? We have all the self-doubt in our own head. We have other people's opinions all around us, everywhere. We hop on social media or the news and everyone's fighting. <laughs> like It's like, there's so much noise that so many people go through life and never learn how to actually break through and tur- turn down the volume on all that stuff, turn down the volume in our own heads of our own self-doubt and actually get still and listen to what it is our gut is telling us, our knowing, our truth, right? And uh, uh, for a lot of people, that's how they hear God. For a lot of people, that that's how they they hear uh, their faith. And I think that doing that is so important. And in the book, I talk about so many tips and lessons on on how I've done it. But I feel like if people are going to do one thing, just really learning to tune in to and listen to their own gut. A lot of people have never done it. A lot of people haven't done it in a long time. A lot of people feel like they don't know how to do it. And part of not knowing how is just because we're not separating that, oh, wait, everything I'm hearing isn't me. I'm hearing my own self-doubt. I'm hearing other people's opinions. I'm hearing my friends and family who love me, but they only see me through their own lens of experience and limitations, right? We have to learn to turn down the volume on all that, get still, listen to our gut, because at the end of the day, it's the single biggest way we're going to step into all of who we are, all of who we're called to be. And I know you have a lot of athletes on and a lot of people and competitions are big. And listen, I'm all for like, competing, all that stuff. Like, oh, trust me. Like I am, I'm driven. Like it's not an accident. We built a billion dollar business, but here's what I know to be true for anybody listening, whether their, their, their dream is to start painting again or to write a book and just write that first page, whatever it is. And I think this is so important by the way, because now we're seeing social media everywhere and it's so easy to fall in that comparison trap. When it comes to competition, the the biggest thing that I know is true, and I think when we focus on this, this is another way to stay really, really positive also, and it's true, is that we're not here to compete with anyone else. Like, we're here to compete with, like, who God made us born to be. Like, we're here to compete with who we know deep down inside we're capable of becoming. And when people really look at it that way, they're like, oh, that's when you know, oh, I'm, I'm not in the right job or, oh, I need to start 
taking that dance class or, oh, I need to, you know, all those things. We know deep down inside if we're on that track of stepping into all, all that we are and, and, and all that we're created to be. It's so good, Jamie. I often say that man's rejection is God's protection. So you're definitely being oh, protected yes. during that time, no doubt. And then also yes. just hearing you talk about your belief, your faith, your intuition. I, I truly believe that the most important words in the world are the ones that we say to ourselves. And it, this, you know, your ability to navigate rejection, your ability to, um, as you say, get quiet and still seems to be, you know, both here in the show and, and in the book, like absolutely foundational. Give us a little bit of like, how long did you work out that muscle? Was it three years? Was it a lifetime? Was it just in a professional capacity or do you make use of this in, in your personal life? Because as you said, not only is this story bigger than you, but it's bigger than business. It's about humanity and uh, you know it, whether you're successful in business or you feel fulfilled in life there's not that much gap between those you know those those two things you can if you have this skill set i believe you can you can create or cultivate fulfillment in all these areas of your life so was it professional personal and how long did you feel like it took before you had the resilience or did it just happen at the right time and you just continue to hone the muscle. Give me a little bit more color there. Yeah. I feel like it is a work in progress still. I feel like it's a lifelong journey. Um, you know, there are so many areas in my life where I went from just completely being overrun by self-doubt and learning how to, um, turn down the volume on my own self-doubt and, 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 I literally chase would imagine, you know, I talk about in the book a lot, um, this idea of like this imaginary microphone or this imaginary volume dial. Right. And, you know, there were times where, you know, I had, I got a strong rejection that hurt so bad from someone. And it's hard when somebody rejects us or says something about us, or we keep telling ourselves, um, you know, things that are maybe reflections of past mistakes or past miscalculations. And we start to label ourselves as things, um, and repeat them over and over. And, you know, I'm, I'm still a work in progress at this, but, but I think, you know, one of the tools I talk about in this book is how do you learn to really just turn down the volume <laughs> on those things and, and interrupt them when, when you start to tell yourself those things, right. Or repeat words that someone else said to you or a label someone else put on you or a past mistake you've made. It's like, how do you turn down the volume on those things and turn up the volume on things that serve you and that remind you of, um, of who you are and, and your strengths and your capabilities and your, um, you know, all those things. It's a work in progress for me. So I still deal with it every single day. And, you know, there's a lot of areas professionally and personally that I've, you know, learned to believe in myself and trust myself and, uh, and know I'm enough in. And then there's other things, um, related to body image that are still challenges for me to this day. Um, you know, as I've been so blessed to meet amazing people like you, um, like Oprah Winfrey, like there's so many people, right. And I, I, I share this, you know, Oprah read the book cover to cover and she was the first person that read my manuscript. And because I wanted her blessing to share a few things in the book, not about, oh, how cool is it that I, you know, uh, Oprah's my mentor, but oh, I'm still scared to call her. I share some real stuff in this book about some real work I'm still doing in real time because I think that we're all works in progress on this lifelong journey. And, you know, I won't go into like all, all of the stuff, but, the, you know, I share in the book for the first time ever about how, um, how I knew my whole life. I, I just had a feeling I was going to meet Oprah. And, and when I finally did, and she invited me to her house for lunch and we had this three hour lunch, just the two of us. And when, when I left the lunch that day, and this was three years ago, she says, she gave me her cell phone number and she said, you can call me anytime, like call me anytime. And I, uh, freaked out internally. And I was like, absolutely. Thank you so much. Here's my cell phone number. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, to this day, Chase, when I have something I want to share with her, I want to, you know, 
say a prayer for her. I want to inspire her. Or I want to ask her advice on something or whatever it is. I will text her or email. Uh, and by the way, when she writes back over text and I see the three dots, like I still freak out. I screenshot it sometimes. Um, <laughs> I will, I will text her and I will, I will email. I have not called. I've not called her. And I had this big realization, um, fairly recently and I wasn't proud of it. And I realized, oh, wow, I still don't believe deep down inside that I'm at the same like vibration level as Oprah to just call her up. And that's something I'm working on in real time because I know that's a lie. I know every one of us, every human being is worthy of calling each other up. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we're all the same. We're all connected. We're all in this life together. Like we all have the same hopes and doubts and fears. And, and so, you know, for me, it's really, it's really a work in progress. There's a lot of areas in my life I've figured it out. And, and so I'm now working <laughs> on applying some of those same, um, the same principles and lessons to, to different areas of my life and, and to making better decisions. And, and I think too, you know, the better we get at it, we also learn to, to trust ourselves when not to trust ourselves, right. For, you know, starting a company with my, my partner. Um, and then we both ended up working hundred hour weeks for 10 years. And it was, I share all about that too. Cause a lot of people either are, or are thinking about starting a dream with a friend or a family member or, or a partner. And, you know, that comes with so much. Right. And, and, to this day, part of why I decided to sell the company was because I learned to trust myself to not trust myself. That if I stayed running it and owning it all, I would still probably be addicted to work and still probably be working 100 hour weeks and still probably um, not have uh, uh, had a baby, all the things. Um, because we tried for 10 years while working 100 hour weeks to, to, to have a baby. And it was just a crazy journey. And so anyways, um, you know, I made the decision in big part to sell the company because I didn't trust myself. I trusted myself enough to not trust myself that I wouldn't <laughs> miss out on life. And so it's all a big journey and that it's all a work in progress. And, and, and to this day, I think, and I think it will be the rest of our lives for all of us. You know, that's, that's one of the things too, is like, I feel so grateful to be able to share all of the things I learned, all the lessons I've learned so far um, in life and in business um, that I hope and pray are of service to other people and save them, you know, nights crying themselves asleep and <laughs> self-doubt and hopefully time and money and all those things. But I think that for the rest of my life, I'll be a, a work in progress too, still really trying to figure it, figure it all out as I go and overcome all that not enoughness that all of us have at deep levels. It's so true that this story is is so much bigger than a billion dollar brand or you know overcoming obstacles as you say we're all in this together but there is this it's it's hard to overstate the feeling that I have about the that this is you know in the particular I think it's James Joyce in the particular lies the universal and your story is the story of so many of us Ladies and gentlemen rock this house and welcome to the stage Jamie Kern Lima! Jamie Kern Lima! Every single one of us has had someone tell us we're not enough. Every single one of us has had someone say words to us that hurt. 